Hello, welcome. Um, this is this is unusual. This is like a, a midweek live stream. This is not normal for the channel, but it's uh, it's good progress. We're here on a Thursday. Um, with me is Christina. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak with us today. Thank you so much, Tom, for the invitation. No, it's it's brilliant. We uh, I say we for those who don't know, um, we we met when Christina was hosting the Ice Spring Days conference. Uh, you facilitated the whole thing, didn't you? And that was fantastic. Um, and we kind of spoke after that. Um, so this is, I think, going to be, it's one of those sessions where when we talk about instructional design, we often get very obsessed with the science of learning, user interface and user experience design, authoring tools, web development. Um, and these things are all massively important parts of what we do. But how we interact with other people and especially our SMEs and how we give and receive feedback on our work and on our ways of working is so important. And the little we do talk about SME management, and I don't think it's enough generally, but mm -hmm. the little we do tends to be very, oh, they're just like us. It makes the assumption that they're in the same building or the same company, certainly the same cultural understanding as you. Um, and after a few conversations with Christina, I kind of really got to thinking about that is just not the case. Um, and I know in my career, some of my biggest uh, failures in my career have come about as a result of me not adapting how I communicate um, to the people that I'm working with. Uh, so this session, I think, is going to be wonderfully useful for all of us, for everyone in the industry. Um, thank you to those of you who are here live um please do get involved in the chat um having checked beforehand Christina likes to be interrupted um which is great because she's on the right channel for that um so I'll be asking questions throughout I'll be jumping in we'd love for you to do the same in the chat um, and I know there will be opportunities to potentially maybe get a little bit involved as well uh, directly during the session um, but if you've got questions, if you've got specifics you want to ask after if something you want to go into more detail about, let us know uh, and we'll do everything we can to make sure you get the value that you want from the session. Um, so without blabbering on any longer, I'm going to shut up and hand over the reins to who you're actually here to listen to because uh, everyone's heard enough from me. Christina, thanks again for joining us and uh, please introduce yourself and uh, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tom. I think nobody could have introduced me better than you did. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you and I'm delighted to be here with our uh, viewers, those who are present. Many thanks. And again, uh, just to repeat what Tom has mentioned, I'm super happy if you ask your questions in the chat during the conversation, during the interactive parts. This is the session that is not meant to become a lecture. This is uh, a session that is meant to become a dialogue, an intercultural dialogue, hopefully, because I do hope that we have visitors from all over the globe watching us, or maybe if people didn't manage to do it um, right during the stream, I hope that some of the participants will also join later and check the recording. Uh, anyway, uh, just before I start the actual introduction and before we start getting to know each other with you guys, uh, those who are with us online, those who are lucky and privileged to participate in the actual conversation, I'd like to uh, build on what Tom has just said in the introduction because I feel that he has already started um, introducing the topic really nicely. Um, Tom has mentioned that um, it's, it's been very customary for all of us to think that our SMEs or um, other partners that we work with are always from the same cultural background as we are. And I'd like to highlight that this definitely doesn't only refer to SMEs, it definitely does refer to anybody in your professional and personal environment. So I do hope that this session will be helpful not only for those who are doing instructional design or um, any other type of work in the domain of learning and development, but I do hope that this will be helpful for anyone who is interested in uh, broadening the horizons beyond your home culture or your local culture. And we'll definitely speak about what it is, what defines the local culture and what makes a, a conversation or a communication intercultural. And there's one more thing that Tom has mentioned, and I'd like to make this as a sort of um, an epilogue to our conversation. Tom said some of the largest um, failures, if I, if I got this right, was 
from the from the lack of adaptivity in the conversation with the colleagues. Um, and I'd like to say that this definitely is something that many people have in mind when it comes to intercultural communication. There is an assumption that we all need to be very adaptive to work in the intercultural environment. However truthful this is, we need to also understand that it's not always necessary to adapt your manner of behavior. Sometimes it's also um, the, the behavior of the other side that needs to be uh, somehow adapted to our standard, or maybe we both need to adapt our behavior. Sometimes we need to make other steps to make sure that we don't compromise with our own beliefs and uh, ways of work, but at the same time still achieve an efficient result. So um, I think this was uh, this was a beautiful intro, and uh, from this point on, I can see that we already have some more participants who have joined the streaming, and I'm happy to kickstart. So Tom, I'll need your help with telling me if I'm good in terms of sharing the right uh, tab. So please tell me if you see the beautiful turquoise screen. I'm not sure if it's visible, but okay. Yep, that's showing, all good. Okay, all right, very well. Uh, I think there might be a little delay in terms of the, in terms of YouTube and uh, how the streaming is done. So apologies if in our conversation with Tom, we might have sometimes uh, um, lag behind a little bit. But again, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, our today's topic of the conversation. This is feedback across cultures and how we work efficiently with our foreign SMEs and other counterparts, as I've already mentioned, let's go beyond the universe of SMEs. I'm happy to produce this material specifically for Tom and specifically for you, dear participants. Uh, and my team and myself, my team from the Agency for International Cooperation, are very excited to share some of the insightful um, ideas thoughts, statistics, maybe something provocative for you today. And I'll be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes, hopefully. And I guess that after that, we'll switch to questions from Tom, from you. And um, I guess that should be a good start of the conversation. So dear friends, uh, at the moment, I'd like to ask you to kindly follow uh, this QR code. Let's get to know each other a little bit. Tom, you are not an exception. I'll be happy if you also use your mobile device, screen this QR code and follow uh, the, um, the link. It should lead you to a Menti poll, uh, which should be available in the majority of the countries across the world. If there is an issue with opening this, um, please uh, feel free to use VPN or other a tool that helps you get uh, online with no problems and no limitations. Uh, this is the QR code that should lead you to a beautiful page, which definitely uh, will be recognizable for you because the page will say that you're on the right slide. Uh, and at this point of time, I'd like to also provide a link to those who are uh, not uh, sure that they are able to screen the QR code. I'd like to share uh, the link uh, to the chat. Uh, Tom, would you think that it will be doable for us to share this link through you? If I uh, leave the link with you and you'll be able to copy that into the chat. Okay. So I believe there is this little delay. Um, Tom, are you with me? Yep, that's all shared for you. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much. For some reason, I um, have no access to uh, checking the chat right now, but I'm, I'm sure you've already shared everything and uh, our participants could get and check the, the slide. So once again, I'd like to share with you the QR code for those who are with us uh, in this fashion. And um, this is the last chance to screen it. And I'm sure at this point of time, you are all already in the Mentimeter slide. And I'll need you just for several questions. That will be more than enough. So let me now switch to Mentimeter screen, which will hopefully um, be openable for all of you. So, let's sorry, uh, Christina, I'm just running into issue. Uh, it's fine from the QR code, but if we follow the link 
that we shared. It takes us to a page not found. It takes us to a page not found. All right. And I apologize for any technical inconvenience. And let's try to use the QR code. Uh, and if everything should be OK with the QR code, then I'm happy to see if you could share with me uh, the country where you, dear participant, were raised in. It should be taking some time for us because of this YouTube delay, but I'll be very happy to see uh, your answers. Again, I'll be happy to hear from Tom if you could share with me if everything's all right. I think I followed the link, but it's not giving me the option to enter the aren't any enter any answers. It just says that I'm on the right slide, but yes, doesn't exactly. let me type anything. That is exactly the right place, and very shortly you should be available. You should open. Yeah. You should have the access to answering the first question. Super. Exactly. So in the chat. Um, Uh, what countries have we got? Uh, yes, guys, if you good. feel like there is something um, that it doesn't function well with Menti, I'll be happy if you leave your answers in the chat. For some reason, Tom, again, I can see that there are pop-up messages in the chat, but I have no idea why I don't see the actual chat. I can see that there are eight messages in the chat, but I don't see the chat messages. Yeah, so it's looking like in Mentimeter, no, we're getting that the slide loads, but then no options to answer. So if you could, if you could pop your answers in the chat, I can see. Uh, obviously, for me, it's the UK. Uh, we have Iran. Okay. Um, so just uh, pop pop in where where you were raised in the chat, and we'll we'll go with that. There we go. Li live troubleshooting. There we go. That's all right. No problem. <laughs> uh, we've got. In order not to uh, in order not to jump back and forth with this Mentimeter, if something goes wrong with it, let's just uh, stick to uh, asking questions orally, and we'll be receiving answers in the chat, and you'll be my voice, and you'll be my eyes for today. Absolutely. So let me put some of these up on screen then. Uh, so we have. Uh, Iran, mm -hmm. we have Russia, we have the USA. Okay. Um, an, an, another from Russia. Okay. Um, oh, we, we are a broad audience today. <laughs> exactly. And you are the only one from the UK, right? Uh, yes, I think so. There we go. That's. But you shouldn't feel lonely. No. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> in this intercultural environment. All right. Thank you very much, guys. My next question to you would be, uh, was there any period of time in your life when you studied, walked abroad, or lived abroad longer than one month? Uh, any answer would be good. Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe yes several times. Um, please leave your comments uh, in the chat, and Tom will be uh, happy to support me in reading them out loud. So again, the question is, um, have you ever spent more than one month living, studying, or walking abroad? Uh, more than one month, yeah. Uh, brilliant. So, uh, for me, yes, Denmark. Um, and then what have we got here? Uh, um, studied, lived, and worked in the U.S. for 11 years. Wow. Um, studied in China two times. Okay. Wow, brilliant. Uh, Carol's, yes, she's been been abroad for that kind of time. So the yeah. majority of our participants are already very well, um, very aware of the differences that might have uh, come across during their experience, which makes it easier for me, that makes it an easier job. Oh, wow, Nepal and France, so you've covered both Europe and Asia, which is fantastic. Great. Uh, my next question in line would be, uh, do you sometimes work or collaborate with colleagues or SMEs from another country or culture? So it's interesting for me to know if you have this experience of collaborating with someone from another country or culture, and I'm putting it on slash, through slash on purpose. So just let us know if yes, no, you plan to, 
I believe you do already if you have had this fantastic experience of working and living abroad. All the time, yes. <laughs> okay, very well. I've worked in academia, worked with people from multiple countries. Okay, Tom, you must have fixed something, online troubleshooting, but I started seeing the pop-up messages all the time. Whenever possible, we have a very international band today. It's true. Okay, thank you so much, dear colleagues. Please keep sending your answers. Yes, yes, all right. We have a very well-prepared group. Tom, uh, compliments to your audience. They are all very well-traveled and already very international. But for those who are watching us and those who don't have this experience, absolutely not to worry. This information that I'm going to share will be as useful for you as for those people who are experienced. So I think I just have two more questions left. Uh, one is, have you ever experienced challenges providing or receiving feedback to a person from a different country or culture? Which is obviously a very natural question for a conversation like the one we have. So have you ever experienced challenges providing or receiving feedback from people of the other countries? All the time, yes. Also, I believe Tom has shared that with me literally this morning. Wow. Tom, I hope this wasn't with me. I do hope it wasn't me. No, it wasn't. That <laughs> but I had a very exciting morning. <laughs> okay, I hope you will share during our conversational part. Okay. Absolutely. Let us wait for a couple of more answers. Actually, many times, many, many times. I trust that, Valeria. Okay, and let's see if maybe just have one or two more answers and we'll proceed to the next question. The last but not the least. Have you experienced any other challenges with the colleagues from other countries? So I'd like to have your opinion on what were these challenges? Of course, they might be diverse. Um, I understand very well that it's hard to put them in one line, but just maybe a few words if there were challenges related to working with the audience or punctuality or maybe issues related to direct expressing of the opinions, anything that comes to your mind. I don't want to put my words into your mouth. So just kindly let me know if you have experienced any other challenges with the colleagues from other countries. Okay. Right. So, Tom, do we have more answers in the chat related to this question? Nothing at the moment. Um, but I know for me, it, it's what regularly happens to me is I'm quite direct. Mm -hmm. um, and some people respond well to directness and yeah. others maybe not so much. Okay. Um, so that tends to be where, where my uh, feedback issues lie. With this I understand. area. Oh, here mm -hmm. we go. Some kind of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. I, I share your pain. It's happened to me as well, many, many times. Cultural differences can cause confusion around expectations. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I think you're still absolutely welcome to share your ideas and thoughts in the chat and maybe they can become the reason, the basis, pardon, for the further questions. But let me proceed with my story, which I'd like to share. Now I, I got to know you a little bit more and I'd like to introduce myself as well because I believe this is going to be helpful for you to formulate questions that would target my expertise better. So I'd like to share with you a few facts about myself and my experience. So I've been working in the sphere of intercultural communication and we'll discuss what it means. And international soft skills for about 10 years already, literally from, from my first years and the first degree in the university. So I've already been volunteering and um, interning and working uh, with various cultures and country representatives. 
I'm very proud that I'm an entrepreneur myself. I founded an agency for international cooperation six years ago, and I'm super happy that I managed to help various clients. Um, and I've had amazing working experiences from uh, translating for the president of Iceland to supporting um, Indian movie stars on their journey to Europe. So a very diverse and interesting type of work I have, but it's all always connected to efficient communication between representatives of different culture and bridging their expectations. Also, I'm a graduate of the University of London, a program on global governance and global ethics. Uh, and I lived and worked in various countries, just like you did participants, uh, from Silicon Valley in California to Australia, the city of Perth. I uh, also had other experiences on my journey, including South Korea and uh, uh, South Africa. Um, I'm a TEDx speaker, though it is done in a different language, not English, but still I think it is. Um, it was an, an important moment for my career development. I traveled to and worked in 61 countries. Uh, the recent one just landed from Saudi Arabia three days ago. So I have a quite long list and I have something to... Um, to base my uh, material on, the actual real hands-on experience. And I'm very, very passionate about finding not only cultural differences, but also cultural similarities. And this is what I believe um, is very important. So it's not only about highlighting the cultural differences and troubleshooting the situations when we all come from different backgrounds and need to understand each other better, but it's also about finding the common ground and building the trust and relationship based on these similarities. So uh, at any point of time, again, feel free to interrupt me because Tom, I don't see you and I don't see the chat, but at any point of time, I'm super happy if you jump in. So I'd like to say that when Tom and I, we were discussing this very broad spectrum of issues, including uh, feedback in intercultural communication, we initially asked the questions to you, dear participants, to Tom's um, audience on LinkedIn, what was interesting for you to explore in the area of intercultural communication? And we received multiple answers, but feedback was one of the most uh, widely mentioned. That's why we decided to go for this stream related to feedback. But the interesting things were, just for your information, and maybe this will be insightful for you, what causes challenges for the other people. People were speaking not only about feedback, but also about criticism and praise across the globe. People were speaking about most common intercultural issues and their solutions, which is, I think, a very normal type of request. Uh, about patience and openness to learning in different cultures, of course, which is very, very normal for the community of uh, learning and development professionals. Language. Culture, uh, colors and hand gestures, and obviously not only hand gestures, but probably generally nonverbal communication, my me, etc., etc. So this absolutely follows into one of the categories of my attention. Um, we have um, also received several requests on how to conduct a brainstorming session with a foreign client, which again is a, a big, broad topic in itself, and I think it's very, very relevant. And we've received several questions on how to better and efficiently provide translation and localization and how to tackle some issues connected to those. Uh, this all six points fall into area of my expertise. But again, today we'll just be speaking about feedback and uh, cross-cultural communication. So there were two other points which don't follow under my expertise, which are licensing content in different countries and authorization issues and working permits in different countries. So this is something that falls into the category of international collaboration or international relations, international work, but doesn't follow exactly into communicational issues, which I'm an expert in. So I'd like to skip those uh, and perhaps I'm not the right person to ask questions related to that. So just for your information. I'd like to also inform you of what my conversation, uh, what my speech is going to be about today. We'll definitely discuss a little bit some generic things about feedback, because before we start discussing feedback in cross-cultural environment, I'd like to make several reminders about when and how we provide feedback internationally, globally, because it turns out that whenever I start the conversation about providing cross-cultural feedback to my clients, very often it turns out that people are confused about the very notion of feedback. So I think we should discuss that as well. 
cultural differences that matter, we'll definitely devote a good chunk of our attention and time to this point. And I'll give you some simple recommendations about how to be more aware about feedback, uh, being both a provider and a receiver. Of course, it's much more typical for us to be asking questions on how to provide efficient feedback rather than how to receive it. So we'll focus more on providing it in a more efficient and natural way. All right. So again, kind reminder what Tom has mentioned in the very beginning. This will all be relevant to you beyond your work with foreign subject matter experts. It will be relevant to your work with contractors, with your students and clients, with your colleagues, with your partners, with anyone who basically comes from a foreign environment. Right. And at this point of time, just because I've recently landed from Saudi Arabia, I was impressed by the Arabic um, alphabet and writing. I've chosen this picture. I'd like to um, um, go through some of the definition differences. And I'd like to set good vocabulary before we embark on this journey. And I'd like to make sure that we all speak the same words, the same English, uh, English language. Um, and I'd like to make sure that we understand the same terms under the same uh, words. If everything is going all right, and um, if I should be happy to continue, or maybe you want to say something. Uh, I think something's just gone a little bit funny with your stream. The sound's coming through. Oh, there we go. We're back. That's fine. I think we just had a slight hiccup with video, but other than that, all good. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. I'll be, you know, making some small pauses just like that to make sure that we are on the same page and on the same slide. All right. Let's continue. So uh, let's speak about definition and differences to make sure that we are on the same. Sorry, table. Christina. We seem yeah. to have. Oh, there we go. Your slide decks come back. We lost your slides for a moment. <laughs> OK. All right. So, uh, they're back now. No worries. Tom, are you mostly um, speaking to your colleagues during the streams to your colleagues from the UK? Uh, most the majority of your um, visa vis are from the same country, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the reasons, maybe, that through the geography, through time and space, it takes a little longer to uh, to get to you. So, yeah. All good. Anyway. That, that's fine. Brilliant. Okay. So, some of the important differences that I like to mention. Why my area of expertise, and in general, the topic that we discussed today, uh, is called intercultural communication or intercultural questions of feedback providing, not international. International is something that relates to crossing the borders effectively. So when you travel from Saudi to Bahrain, from uh, Chile to Argentina, from the USA to Canada, this is all international. And you can have international contracts, international negotiations, international projects, and international collaboration, for sure. But what is very, very important is that sometimes we misunderstand that the term intercultural can be much more relevant than international in the discussion of communicational efficiency. Because when it comes to intercultural communication, we not only mean crossing the border and effectively signing contracts or doing business with the people holding other passports. We are mostly speaking about people from a different culture who might easily live in the same country as you live, in the same city and even in the same neighborhood. I'm sure it's very, very familiar for the majority of our listeners that within the majority of countries, perhaps apart from Japan, which is the most mono-ethnic country in the world, we most likely uh, interact with people of various cultural backgrounds, uh, ethnic, religious, etc. Even generational differences matter here, and generations form their certain culture, regardless of how you call generation by the letters, X, Y generation, etc., or um, other uh, types of generational differentiation. So when it comes to intercultural, we mostly speak about the differences that exist between huge societal groups, and that doesn't necessarily need to be international collaboration in this fact. So um, it's very, very evident for the, the um, countries with diverse ethnic groups in, in inside the country, and it's also very, very obvious 
for those who um, live in the larger countries and the communities where you have a big number of expats or migrant groups. So it is very, very possible that during your uh, work in India, if you are in India, uh, you can easily interact with dozens and hundreds of cultural groups within your country. And it's very possible that you'll be speaking English as lingua franca, but still at the same time will be sharing different cultural perspectives, values, will be speaking different native languages, etc., etc. You'll belong to different religious groups. So it's important that when it comes to feedback and other um, points of uh, interest in the intercultural communication, we speak specifically about intercultural, not only international. Also, I'd like to say that feedback is not at all about criticism or praise, and it's absolutely not only about emotional reflection. Feedback is the information that you provide to another person with a different purpose rather than just to criticize or to praise. And feedback is definitely, of course, uh, sometimes um, including emotional reflection as a part of it, but it definitely doesn't equal it. So sometimes emotional reflection should be put aside when it comes to proper feedback. So I just like to be sure that when we speak about feedback, we don't at the same time mean only criticism or only praise and emotional reflection. So these are different categories and I'd like to put them aside. And I'll, of course, again, get back to the definition of feedback a little later. And why I've asked you this question about where you were raised and uh, uh, what other countries you've spent your time in, it is important to point out that the country of birth for every one of us doesn't equal the cultural pattern. So if a person is born in the UK, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would follow the standard stereotypical cultural patterns of the United Kingdom. First of all, because there are multiple reasons for that. Second of all, because they might have traveled, lived and walked abroad. And the cultural patterns of other countries, especially if this traveling happened during the early age, could have made a strong influence. And that is why I'd like to make sure that we distinguish between the country of birth and the general cultural pattern that this or that person follows. So it's important to make sure that if we speak with an, again, Australian person, that doesn't necessarily mean that this Australian person would definitely fall into similar categories of being punctual or providing feedback in the same fashion as an average Australian person would. All right. And I'd like to just make sure that we get a bit more practical in these recommendations that I'm going to be providing. I just want to make sure that you recognize yourselves in the stories that I'm sharing and the comments that I'm sharing, because I'm sure that the recommendations sometimes are hard to relate to your personal practice unless you recognize yourself in the story. So when are the recommendations about intercultural feedback reasonable and when they are acceptable in what cases first and foremost of course their need for feedback emerges when an sme or a partner doesn't follow initial agreements so you've agreed upon something or you had an idea that you've agreed upon something but it turns out that the agreements are not being followed and there is something going wrong between the agreement and the execution the communication might go differently compared to what you expected. For example, the pace of correspondence, how quickly you exchange messages and how quickly you get the responses. Punctuality, so when and how people come to the meeting or to the session or um, to a certain event, in person or online, doesn't really matter. For some cultures it matters, but for the majority it's still kind of usually the similar pattern. The means of communication, you would expect a person to get back to you by email, but they would come back to you by WhatsApp or in many cases, uh, Chinese people would expect you to come back to them through uh, a local WeChat or the Koreans would expect you to talk to them on Kakao Talk, especially those who are not very well traveled or didn't have much of the co cooperation experience with the foreigners. So means of communication can also differ. And in this case, sometimes you might have a certain expectation to be set and the communication goes differently compared to what you expected. Sometimes your feedback that you've already tried to express is not perceived or heard of by your partner or SME. 
So in a certain case, we sometimes follow the typical pattern in our culture and we provide the feedback in the way we got used to that. But you notice that feels like this, this, this doesn't work very well. So there, you must play a different type of game. Or when you're not satisfied with the results of work or want to introduce significant changes. Obviously, this is something which is probably the most important reason for um, considering what's going on and what's wrong with my way of providing feedback. So with the other points, lack of initial, um, lack of uh, following for initial agreements, communication means difference or um, feedback being not very well heard of. We sometimes tolerate that, but when it comes to the results of work and when we want to introduce significant changes, it sometimes gets much, much tricky and much more, more, more tricky. And of course, when you intend to finish collaboration or review your agreements, for the majority of cultures, this requests a certain feedback to be done. For some cultures, finishing collaboration just requests silencing, which is very interesting. And I'm sure some of you, especially working with some Asian partners, could have noted that, that when somebody wants to finish collaboration, they just, you know, ignore you and uh, no longer answer your questions or no longer answer your emails. But still, for some cultures, it is important to provide feedback before finishing collaboration or dramatically reviewing the agreements. So at this point of time, I'm happy to give you some of the important points about feedback itself, about the very international notion of feedback. Because again, I'm sure this is going to be very helpful for the majority of our listeners. And again, uh, making a super short uh, break to double check if we're doing okay. And uh, Tom, you haven't fallen asleep so far. You're doing good. Yep, still here, still clinging on. No, really, really interesting stuff. Um, got the same in the comments. People, you know, sort of very uh, looking forward to the next section. All right, very well. Me too. Thank you so much. So then let's continue. I will now go through some of these points which I believe are important to understand and figure out before we actually go into the sphere of intercultural feedback. So um, this is a small picture which I hope will be very illustrative for all of us when it comes to providing feedback. Because one of the biggest challenges and differences um, between providing emotional uh, sharing or proper feedback, between providing a professional feedback and insulting, for example, lies exactly in this picture. And if there is something that I want you to memorize out of this workshop, one would be this picture and another one will be closer to the end of my uh, story. So please pay serious attention to that. I'll be happy to share my presentation and slides with you later on, so there is no need to actually do screenshots. But uh, this exact picture is something that I hope you'll take away from the session. Very, very often, when it comes to providing feedback within our own local culture, providing it to someone who works nearby you, close to you, or providing it to someone that you know very well, we have this um, understanding that because we speak the same language, because we were raised in the same environment, there is a certain flexibility in the manner and the way how we can provide feedback. So people would anyway understand us. They would anyway understand that we mean no bad, in case we definitely don't want to mean bad. And uh, in general, it will be more or less nicely perceived. However, when it comes to doing it interculturally, of course, there are other uh, obstacles that are on the way and we need to understand them. And of course, something that could have been done a little wrong in terms of general feedback theory uh, in our own native language with our own locality could have turned into a disaster within it when we speak a foreign language or one of the um, one of the pair, one of the vis-a-vis -vis speaks the language that is not nat na native language to them. So what does this picture uh, supposed to mean for us? As you can see, we have a cook or a chef or doesn't matter, whatever you want to call it, it's lovely gentleman in, uh, in a beautiful hat. The gentleman has prepared a cake, maybe a birthday cake, maybe a wedding cake, we really don't know, but it's not important for our discussion. And also a cook has been using certain tools and equipment to make sure that the cake is properly prepared. So what we can see is whenever we are facing the results of somebody's work, it is totally okay to provide feedback, which is your opinion related to a certain amount of 
procedures performed. So it's totally okay to relate your feedback to the work or to the hard and soft skills of this or that professional. But it's totally not okay, whatever culture you take, whatever industry you take, whatever religious or ethnic group you take, it's totally not okay to provide feedback to a personality. The only time when the feedback to personality could be suitable and acceptable would probably be a session with a psychologist or probably be a very, very personal conversation between very, very close people. So when it comes to feedback in professional environment, however close uh, your vis-a-vis -vis is to you, it is very important to figure out that the green arrows symbolize to us that we can provide feedback to work and we can provide feedback to hard and soft skills used. However, it's absolutely prohibited to provide feedback to a personality. Let me give you a couple of examples. So when it comes to this specific cake, we can say that the cake had a wonderful taste or the cake was not sweet enough. And this will be the characteristic of the work. And it is an acceptable feedback, positive or negative. When it comes to hard and soft skills, we can say that the cake was produced in a timely manner and we managed to do everything just according to our plan. So it was great soft skill that the cook utilized, the chef utilized. Or we can say that the cake arrived later or maybe in the wrong packaging, which means that the soft skills of the cook were in, or maybe part of hard skills uh, were criticized by you. But we never ever manage, we never ever mention any positive or negative characteristics to the personality, which is, again, very, very important, specifically in some cultures, more than in the others. But in general, it's not acceptable to be targeting a personality for the feedback. So we never say that you are a terrible cook or that you are better than the rest of the cooks. Perhaps it sounds like a good compliment. And for many, it is something that uh, is very acceptable. However, I'd like to figure out that this would be more emotional sharing and a more personal comment rather than the feedback provided in the professional environment. So once again, we are targeting the work and the results of the product or the service or the hard and soft skills of this or that SME or partner, but we refrain from the personal comments. And again, this a simple rule will save you a lot of um, emotions, a lot of nerves and a lot of time and hopefully will keep your partnership stronger. So important to figure this out, never targeting personality. Uh, in the example of an SME, we can say that the course that was provided or the lecture that was provided was very intensive and answered all the expectations and the students deeply enjoyed the material provided we can also say that we enjoyed the most uh, dynamic way in the way the material was provided. And we also enjoyed the fact that uh, our counterpart was or wasn't maybe, and we don't enjoy it, or in touch with us during the preparatory phase. But we never managed to say something like, um, you are a terrible lecturer or uh, you are not a, a good professional. This is something that we definitely don't accept as proper feedback. So this is something that I want to be sure that you memorize. Another thing that I want to figure out before we progress is when and how to give or not to give feedback. Uh, look at this matrix. Again, this is quite useful, maybe not as useful as the cook picture, but still quite useful. I'd like to show to you the cases when feedback is timely and feedback is properly provided and cases when it's probably not um, really in time and probably not really very desirable. The best situation for providing feedback is when a person to whom you're providing feedback is actually interested in hearing feedback. So when a person asks for feedback, this is the most important prerequisite for the conversation. In some cultures, asking for feedback is not considered to be appropriate, and we will speak about that a little later. But at the same time, uh, there are ways how you can create the situation when uh, feedback is being requested. You can simply sometimes uh, directly or indirectly ask a question if feedback is desirable. At the same time, you should be interested in changing the behavior or the results of work for the future. 
So if you continue to, if you plan to continue the cooperation, and at the same time, your vis-a-vis -vis asks for feedback, this is bingo. And then please, this is an encouraged request. Uh, this is important and this is the right place to ask and provide for feedback. When you're not interested in changing the behavior, it stays up to you. Um, think, uh, probably, I'm, I'm so sorry, I, um, oops, I think I must have had a little confusion with the, um, yes, I'm so sorry, I must have had a confusion about the, um, the words in the cells. I apologize for that. I will redo that for the final version of the presentation. Must have checked several times, Christina, too bad. But anyway, bingo is where we are interested in changing the behavior and another person asks for feedback. Uh, we definitely should think, think several times if we're not interested in continuing the collaboration and if another person is not interested in feedback and there is probably not the right time and not the right place if you are not interested in continuing the um, conversation or the collaboration and the person is not interested in uh, feedback. So this is the simple matrix and these are the two simple criteria which all of us should keep in mind before providing or requesting feedback. And uh, last reminder before we proceed to the intercultural part is about the hamburger. So I'm pretty sure that you guys have heard about this, especially those who are raised in the um, English speaking cultures. Uh, feedback in the form of a sandwich or a hamburger is something that is very, very typical and very, very widespread, something we are taught in the universities, at managerial courses, sometimes in our families, that whenever there is feedback, there is an interesting and important notion that should be kept in mind. We should start with something positive, uh, introdu introduce and insert something negative in the middle, and then wrap it up, and then wrap it up or polish it with something positive again. So I'd like to ask you if you guys are familiar with this concept, share your points in the chat. Have you ever used this sandwich type of feedback? Have you ever um, found that this was a successful method? Uh, or maybe vice versa, you found that this was not useful for some cultures and people really get lost when it comes to providing feedback like that. So what maybe while we're waiting for the answers, Tom, will you be so kind to share your uh, insight about the use, the use of such model? Yeah, so um, it's got lots of names, that one. And uh, it's interesting you have a training because when I, remember when I was first trained as a, as a people manager, absolutely, this is how you give feedback. It's the best way to do it. Um, and I found, you know, it's weird, I found some people are fine with it. I personally can't stand it. Um, like if someone's got to give me feedback about work, I just want them to tell me. I don't, it's not that I don't care about whether or not they like the work, mm -hmm. but if something needs to be changed, that's what I need to know. I, I, if you say that bit's perfect, that's great, but I don't actually, that doesn't help me improve anything. Mm -hmm. um, so especially with SMEs, usually for me, they're reviewing, you know, a plan or a, or a, or a, a sort of project statement or, or a piece of work. And when I get um, kind of comments back going, yep, love this, you kind of go, okay, that's fine. Scroll past that because... That I, I, I'm looking for the what do I need to do bit of the mm -hmm. feedback. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of what I mean about me being slightly more direct maybe than yeah. some, um, because the danger is, of course, that I have to always remember I hate receiving feedback like that. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. everyone else hates the bun. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, yeah. I clearly I'm just a just give me the meat person don't want all that bread nonsense take out the lettuce take out all those vegetables I want the big bit of fatty meat in the middle <laughs> definitely you are no vegetarian in this kind of preference okay um, um let's oh we've got a comment come through though okay. um do you have any experienced cultures that do not respond well to this hamburger me I am that culture <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> um and if so what are these cultures so that's quite because that's again i've always just kind of viewed it as a oh it must just be i, I know other people that are like me um but i know for me for instance I, it's not really a cultural thing mm -hmm. um weirdly i i kind of blame my dad um he's got no time for any fluff as we tend to just tell me what the problem is so we can fix it 
that's our kind of approach to life. Um, so it's quite interesting. Do you find there are cultures that specifically do not respond to the the hamburger or the sandwich model? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for this uh, input. And thank you, um, uh, our participant who asked the question about not responding well to the hamburger feedback rule. I'd like to explore more about um, Tom's uh, family history now because it would be interesting to see what kind of environment does Tom dad come back from uh, professionally and um, in terms of maybe, I don't know, um, educational background, etc. because it feels like there are certain types of jobs which are much more interested in receiving this meaty part. For example, lawyers would be amongst those who are like, I am here to correct your amount, your agreement or your contract, and you need to tell me which are the things that need to be improved. While the other types of uh, jobs, maybe more creative professionals, they'll prefer more fluffy feedback, uh, being sensitive to uh, their creative uh, results of work. But again, I'm not here to stereotype or impose certain stereotypes over this or that group of people, which is the last thing I want to do. But it's interesting what Tom has mentioned. I'm I'm looking for the feedback because it gives me a chance to improve some things that need to be improved. And here Tom has clearly identified a very important part of the UK uh, general average culture, which is a merit-based culture. Let me explain that right now in a few details and later I'll proceed and give more details to that. But what I want to say is uh, in the UK, Compared to, for example, China, let's take a large, uh, a large culture like China, or uh, we, we have had a colleague from um, Iran uh, who was also with us. And again, she has spent a long time in the US, but I believe it was she, if I'm not mistaken, pardon me if, if I'm wrong. Uh, they've spent a long time in the US, so it might have changed. But such cultures as Iran or China would be predominantly relationship-based. So when it comes to a collaboration between two people or two entities, a UK average person, again, such a terrible thing because it leads to the stereotyping, but on average, if we take large statistics accumulated within the recent dozens of years, an average person would focus on continuing a certain work that should have its own merit. So we are interested in delivering the result no matter what. And I'm saying we because I also am a part of a merit-based uh, culture, though I'm not from the UK. But personally, I share this approach. However, there are other cultures, such as China, for example, or Iran, and multiple other cultures, which would collaborate with each other, not just to create a certain result of work, but to sustain a relationship. Those are more communal cultures. And for them, breaking a relationship with somebody, even for the sake of delivering the best result, would be a no-go approach. So, uh, in this regard, uh, answering the question of our, of our audience, this doesn't exactly reflect the question of who doesn't like the hamburger style approach, uh, but answering your question about the cultures that would not be very happy with the hamburger style approach, we would see the cultures that would not recognize any need behind the bun. For example, if you take Eastern European countries, post-Soviet countries, for example, no, no matter what you take, Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, um, you might take also even Central European uh, countries sometimes. Um, predominantly, I've uh, experienced a certain number of cases like that with my French uh, partners. Whenever you use a lot of dal, a lot of bun around your meat, people just don't recognize it there. Because uh, usually in the sandwich model, you have two thirds of the time devoted to uh, positive feedback and only one third of the time devoted to negative feedback, people generally deprioritize this and feel like, oh, in general, everything was fine. Why should I change something? And at the same time, because in some cultures, including post-Soviet cultures, it's much more obvious and direct in terms of the way how you provide feedback, People generally don't expect any positive feedback in case something needs to be changed. So if you want some things to be changed, it should be very clearly stated, and this should be the only thing that should be stated. Otherwise, they're unlikely to receive your changes. But I think we're getting uh, a bit far ahead, uh, and I think it's good time for us now to introduce the models of cultural differences, unless we have some other comments or questions, Tom. 
we do we've got a, we've got a couple of comments come through actually um so we've got uh see it's uh it's quite a popular way to give feedback however i suppose it's not so common uh, for asian countries for some cultures it's important to have lots of sugar coating it is true i couldn't agree more it's truly so and what is more sometimes you would even need to avoid meat and substitute it with soya meat or whatever and find the ways to introduce your ideas uh, in the fashion that it doesn't sound like negative feedback at all in the fear of losing face and in the fear of breaking their relationship so one of such examples could be done um, imagine tom that you have an expert from let's finish with china and let's speak for example about korean experience because i've studied in Korea myself for quite a time and uh, experienced quite a lot of this type of uh, behaviors and feedbacks. Imagine you have an SME or a lecturer who delivers lectures on a certain number of topics and it feels like topic A is quite a successful result, it was well done, but topic B doesn't sound interesting to students, doesn't seem to be delivered well, and in general it feels like we'd better stop the collaboration with this expert on topic B so I'd like to ask you, Tom, and I'd like to ask the other colleagues in the chat, what would be, in your opinion, uh, the most approachable and the most amicable way of delivering uh, negative feedback in this regard to a person from a culture which definitely prefers much more of sugar coating and even a hint, soya meat rather than just meat? Oh, well, I mean, do let us know in the comments because this is way out of my comfort zone. Uh, this is this is where people like me, if I'm in charge, go. I'm just going to call someone more equipped than me to deal with this situation. Like, um, like you know, right? <laughs> this is why you employ people, as far as I'm concerned. They deal with that stuff. Um, but no, I think certainly, my if I know that there's someone who's not going to want that directness. Um, I would probably suggest that we're not so much ending the relationship, but shifting it and focusing all the effort on the one that's going really well mm -hmm. and maybe minimizing the effort we put into the one that clearly isn't very good, uh, but probably not say it isn't very good, but just say less popular maybe and mm -hmm. consider, you know, not placing the blame on them um, to an extent. I do think there's also, and maybe, you know, I'd be interested to hear how you'd manage this, because, I mean, ultimately, there is there is a reason that second one is not doing well. Mm -hmm. And it might be, you know, uh, it might be an organizational issue with me. Yeah. It might be an audience issue, exactly. but actually it might be them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you can deflect a certain amount, but. I mean, I'd be interested because I'm always worried that if we deflect too much, mm -hmm. then people don't get the feedback that actually they could. That second one could be successful right. if they changed it. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, my def if we know we're not going to do it anymore at all, I would say we're going to focus on A and sideline this other one for now. Um, but yeah, I guess my concern is always: does that fix the problem, or does that just kick it down the road? Because eventually we're going to come back to B, and it's still going to be not great. Um, exactly. I like that Tom has used this very comprehensive approach and he has clearly mentioned that sometimes the problem with B is not exactly the lecturer, the Korean lecturer. It could be the question of uh, poorly explained expectations. It could be the issue of uh, students that were um, maybe not exactly well prepared to receive this material or it could be a variety of options and in this regard I do recognize the importance of not just jumping into um, speaking to the experts straight away regarding this exact issue, but analyzing and screening and monitoring the environment in a better fashion. And I wish there was a proper uh, manual for screening all sorts of environments, but they are so diverse that it's hard to, you know, come up with a one fitted all pill. But all in all, if, say, you have already utilized certain effort in screening the environment and understanding what was going on, and if you understood that, indeed, the issue is with the lecturer or with an SME, and it feels like it wouldn't be very productive to continue the lecturing in this specific fashion, 
I do agree that it would be much, much more acceptable to say that we focus on the first, which is of a fantastic result. And in order to keep up with this result, we suggest that we only focus on the first one. Whilst with the second one, um, there could be different options for the person not to lose face, such as, for instance, offering a mentorship position for a new young lecturer who could benefit from the wisdom of an experienced teacher. Or maybe we could offer a different type of engagement, such as um, this lecturer or this SME might be able to interact with the students and check their homework, whilst a less busy and, say, maybe less experienced lecturer will be delivering the course. So there are, there are multiple options how to make sure that we sustain a relationship and at the same time make sure that we receive a desirable result. But in sandwich model, in this particular case of um, Japan or Korea or China or in Iran and many Arabic cultures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, would be probably, you know, we have to be very situative in this regard. So, all right. Do we have any other comments, Tom? Uh, yeah, we had a few come through. Um, so, uh, I personally prefer being told that I did what I did right. Um, before I'm told what I did wrong, I always do unto others as I would have them doing to me. So that's that's really interesting. That's mm -hmm. kind of the exact opposite of what I look for in feedback. Exactly. Isn't that beautiful that we are so different? Mm. But it's so challenging for the managers and the um, the leaders of organizations to make sure that we satisfy the expectations. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that we, first of all, even understand the scope of how different people can be? Yeah, we've just touched upon one specific domain, like how people perceive feedback and how they better react to that. Because in the long run, we are not here to, you know, babysit our lecturers or managers. We are not here to, you know, satisfy every single uh, caprice or specific culture related desire. Again, as I'm telling you, there is not always a need to exactly adapt your style to every single different lecturer or specialist that we work with. What is important is to understand the spectrum, to identify a person on this spectrum, and to understand how we can find the most suitable model. So let's discuss this. If you don't mind, I'll proceed and share with you uh, the uh, several theories on cultural differences, which I hope will be helpful for a better understanding of uh, intercultural feedback. So uh, I'd like to uh, share with you, among all different theories and interesting statistical data and analysis, one specific theory which is perhaps the most popular these days and is perhaps the most widely known across the business world these days, uh, is the um, concept of aid cultural access by uh, Erin Mayer, who is a French-American scientist currently working in INSEAD. She is a very well-known, recognized professional in the area of intercultural communication, the author of the book, The Culture Map, which I strongly recommend to everyone. And I'd like to just share with you the eight differences in which we can be seen as very different creatures de de depending on our uh, cultural, professional, ethnic, religious backgrounds. So uh, in general, Ari Mayer stands on the fact that every country would either be low context or high context, will be providing direct negative feedback or indirect negative feedback, will be first interested in seeing cases and then, uh, sorry, will be first interested in seeing theory and then interesting in seeing um, cases, will be more egalitarian or hierarchical, will be more consensual or more, let's say, authoritative, will be task-based or merit-based, as I told you, or relationship-based, will be more confrontational or avoiding confrontation and will be more punctual or less punctual. But what I'm trying to say here is I'm deeply convinced that depending on your um, background in terms of profession, ethnicity, um, religion, etc., your personal characteristics makes you not exactly represent, make you not only the representative of a certain country as a culture, but also make you as a person more high context, low context, more directly open to negative feedback or indirectly open to negative feedback, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these eight dimensions, these eight axes, 
um, are just one of the ways to perceive intercultural differences. As I told you, there are multiple frameworks of looking at intercultural differences. So it's not the only one, and it's not, um, let's say, the, the, the exhaustive list of differences that we uh, have in mind. But, and I'm sure what is more, we still haven't researched all of them. So there, there is still a lot of space to explore for the cultural scientists, for the anthropologists, for the social scientists. However, this specific framework suits us very well for today's conversation because this gives us a chance to uh, identify how people uh, specifically perceive and react to feedback. So the axis number two is very interesting for us because it gives us a chance to understand that there are some people who prefer direct negative feedback, like Tom and the other colleagues who um, recognize themselves in the words of Tom, and indirect negative feedback. Perhaps uh, somewhere here we will see people who are able to perceive negative feedback coated uh, and hidden in, in the realms of uh, two bonds of positive feedback. But here we will find people who only can perceive negative feedback if it's very nicely camouflaged and very nicely uh, sugar-coated. At the same time, uh, among these access, what we can see is what is very, very important for us is the leadership culture. So depending on whether a person follows a more egalitarian approach or a more hierarchical approach, we should recognize that sometimes negative feedback will be perceived in a normal, functional way if it's given by someone of a higher position in the hierarchy. Yeah. So if someone is providing you negative feedback and this is your colleague or uh, you know peer, this will be seen as something outrageous for a person from a hierarchical society. At the same time, with a person from a more egalitarian society, and usually we refer to these societies as more democratic societies, it's totally okay to perceive feedback from someone who's close to your position or close to your rank, and there is nothing wrong about this. There is one more thing which I want to highlight here, the trusting scale. Again, merit-based or task-based, when we as a team or we as professionals are mostly working on delivering the task and the result, whilst the other cultures will be more focused on relationship-based um, approaches. So when we need to highlight the importance of uh, long-term collaboration rather than fixing one specific task. Sometimes it is important to be more soft on your feedback and achieve better results in a more longer-term perspective compared to just fixing this one specific case this time today. The other points, in my opinion, can be also very influential for feedback, but in order not to divert too much of your attention and of course, because I've already spoken for too long and I didn't expect that it will take too long, um, I really just want to make sure that you are familiar with these access and that you recognize how important they are in terms of identifying what kind of person is in front of you and what kind of principles they usually follow in their culture. So one more thing I want to show before we switch into more practical matters would be the fact that everything is very relative. And as I told you, regional and national cultures, and by regional, sometimes we say Eastern, Western, Southern, Northern, or let's say big regions such as Latin America or Europe. We, of course, stand on this background because we were raised or we were influenced by a certain culture. But there are also ethnic cultures, professional cultures. Oh my God, corporate cultures are so, so important. And personal characteristics, they matter a lot. And of course, sometimes you might see a person who, based on his country of origin, might be very direct on his or her negative feedback style. But at the same time, because of personal, corporate or professional characteristics, person might be shifting more towards less direct negative feedback as a perception. So with these things in mind, I'd like to make sure that we remember about these two important points. The cultures vary dramatically in terms of their business approaches. And all of these eight axes are so important in every professional environment. But at the same time, we should never stereotype and see a person behind every single situation and recognize that if, for example, um, the Americans are very much low context and the British people are a bit 
more high context, it doesn't necessarily mean that a specific American or a specific British person would be exactly on the same uh, position on these access. So my shift, this might vary, but the, the disposition of these cultures uh, on the axis is done thanks to huge statistical research, specifically by Garrett Hofstetter and Erin Mayer and other scientists. So right now, at this point of time, I'd be super happy if I could show you some real cases related to some real specific cultures. And at this point of time, I'll again make a super uh, short pause and I'll ask if we are good and maybe we have some important comments that need to be answered right now before we jump into some practical activities. Uh, no comments, but that was all really good. I have shared a link to the culture map book um, on Amazon. Uh, sorry, it's Amazon. Is what it is. Everything's on Amazon. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, uh, but yes, so if you want it, it's people. a fantastic read. So uh, it's well worth getting. Um, but have no, no comments through so far. Have you read this book, Tom, yourself? Mm. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it's given to me a little while ago. Um, I, sh I I didn't take it too personally when someone went, you should read this. Um, I think they just thought I'd find it interesting, but it's very, very good. Uh -huh. Very, um, very accessible, which mm -hmm. I think is a challenge in this topic. So a lot of what you find online is either dumbed down to the point where it's not helpful anymore mm -hmm. or so complex that unless you already actually get it, you struggle to understand what it's really trying to tell you. Um, but I found it work, walked a really nice middle ground. Um, so definitely, I would certainly recommend it. Mm, very, very well. I'm happy about that. And I'm so sorry that I didn't bring in a lot of new insights into your, uh, your personal uh, knowledge on this topic. But let's hope that something that I'm going to show now is going to be uh, more insightful. All right. So... Um, Tom, I'd like to kindly ask you now to help me a little bit more and I'm going to ask our dear participants to share in the comments um, one, per, one comment per person, a country that they would like to explore in terms of these access. So in terms of how direct or indirect the culture is for uh, this or that country. So maybe it will be the country that you live in or maybe that will be the country that your counterparts are from. So I'd like to explore different real cases with real countries. Uh, so please give me the names of countries that you're mostly interested in right for this specific experiment, okay? All righty. And now, while we are waiting for the, um, for the countries to come, I would like to share with you the first case that I think can be very, very helpful. Tom, please confirm if you see the country mapping tool on my screen. Uh, we see the real cases slide. Uh huh. How about now? Still the real cases? Uh, yes, yeah, still that slide at the moment. All right. Uh, let me give it a try again and uh, share a different window. How about now? There we go. We see the country mapping tool. Fantastic. Right. It also belongs to the same Erin Mayer statistic pool. So for the very first try, I'd like to have a look at the UK where Tom comes from. And I'd like to take two other countries which would probably be perceived as something very close to the UK. Just because, for example, in the United States, they speak the very same language. While in France, you're very geographically close. And of course, it is very, very natural. And a lot of people know that there is a big difference between the UK and the US and France. And there are multiple jokes about that. But still, let's have a look at how the differences would be visible in terms of the graphs. So I've just chosen the UK for, uh, and it says Great Britain GB for red. Or orange would be the US and yellow would be France. So let's have a look at the negative uh, feedback axis. And we will see that France actually prefers a more direct negative feedback. And if you start sugarcoating for a French person, they would probably most likely not change anything in their attitude and behavior. While the US and the UK people would be the exact fantastic examples of the sandwich cultures, which would prefer to have something more... Um, 
nice in the beginning and in the end and something substantive in the middle. So something should be sad there. And have a look at one more interesting um, observation. While in the USA, we usually say that this is a very direct culture, which is low context. So it means you don't have to have a similar context with the person you're talking to in order to understand each other. So usually you're very direct, obvious, and straightforward. With the negative feedback, it actually is vice versa. So the Americans are very straightforward in their desires and protecting their rights, in expressing their opinions. But at the same time, they'll be much more moderate in terms of providing direct negative feedback, which is interesting. And the totally uh, opposite happens to France. You see a very highly contextual France. Well, not very, but enough quite highly contextual France, which will be using phrases between the lines to express certain ideas, wouldn't be very frank and open. But at the same time, they'll be very direct in their negative feedback. So do not take the openness and the directness of a person as the exact equivalent to the way how they provide negative feedback. And I think this is very, very important. You can also see the big differences in other points, uh, but I'll be happy again to share this um, with you later. You can also have access to this tool. It is um, a chargeable tool, but I'll be happy to share these exact screenshots with you. So at this point of time, I'd like to ask um, uh, Tom if we have received any countries as example countries for our case study. We have indeed. Um, so we have two requests. Uh, which is India um, okay. and Japan. Oh, interesting. That's a good choice because we'll definitely see a great diversity over there. Um, it will be a beautiful example for us as well because this will show to us how the so-called uh, Asian countries or Eastern countries, which are in the view of a Westerner, are seen as something monolithic, how indeed different they can be especially, as I told you, considering that India is a very diverse country with multiple ethnic groups, multiple language groups, multiple religious backgrounds as well. Not all the Indian people are Hindu. There are multiple Muslim people, Christian people, Buddhist people, etc. While Japan being very mono-ethnic, very closed and reserved in, in, in the current social demographic status. So let's have a quick look at how we're going to approach um, in terms of feedback to our uh, partners from India and Japan. I'll be happy to share this right in a second. Please tell me if you can see the screen again. Uh, yes, we can. India, Japan, and I've left the UK. Would that be okay for us? I think so. All right, let's have a look. All right. Ah, I'm so sorry, I've kept France for some reason. Let's get back to the country selection, just for the sake of experiment. All right, here we go. Very, very interesting. So we can see that um, the UK is in red, India is in blue, and Japan is in orange. So as very um, expectable, we can see that Japan is definitely on the list of the countries which would prefer a very, 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 very subtle negative feedback, if any, uh, for the sake of not losing face. There is also an important point where India and the UK, however uh, far away they might seem, especially for those who live in these two countries, they're quite close in terms of their uh, position on the scale of direct negative feedback. At the same time, as we can see, um, the uh, leadership situation, Japan and India are very hierarchical cultures and it's more than okay to receive negative feedback from your leader or from the leader of your leader. But at the same time, it probably would not be necessary for the UK person to receive feedback uh, to be in the higher position, to receive negative feedback, right? Uh, other important uh, point is that um, India and Japan will be very relationship-based, whilst the UK will be more task-based. And multiple other differences are in front of our eyes, and I think that this is pretty, um, this is pretty uh, curious for all of us who want to explore. Um, so, bridging from here to my next point on the agenda, I'd like to ask you, um, to say that, I'd like to ask you to keep in mind one thing. 
the thing is, in many cases, when we are in real practice, we don't have this opportunity to come and go on to a statistical tool to check the uh, tons and tons of information related to a specific culture. Uh, how do we actually explore in which way we can approach this or that person with this or that cultural background? So I've showed to you how differences, how different the business approaches can be, um, how different the perceptions might be. But then when it comes to practice, what do we actually do in order to make sure that we don't fail? So before we answer that question, and I hope we'll answer that question together, I'd like to share with you the slide, which I also hope will be helpful. Uh, this is the slide that is meant to demonstrate to you what can go wrong. Uh, because in many cases, we usually think that the, the feedback prov provision uh, is only meant to correct a certain behavior. And if this behavior is not corrected, then this is something that goes wrong. But in fact, there are many other multiple layers that can go wrong, which I want you to think about. So first of all, it might happen that your SME or partner doesn't expect any feedback because you are not in the position to provide this feedback, because it's too early to provide the feedback, because the students are not the people who are supposed to provide the feedback, but maybe the leadership is supposed to. So it might happen that you are the one who desires to provide feedback, but there is no expectation for feedback whatsoever. Your SME or partner doesn't understand that what you provide is called feedback. They might think that this is an emotional reaction. They might think that this is something that uh, maybe just uh, is your personal opinion rather than the professional um, reaction to the work. This might be seen as some, um, I don't know, external comment that doesn't clearly relate to their work, especially if it's done in a very highly contextual manner. So I just like to make sure that it's not always understandable that what you're saying is called feedback. Your SME partner doesn't see feedback as necessary at all. So there might be an expectation that the job is done and once the payment is processed or once the, the contract is closed or once the course is over, no feedback is necessary whatsoever. So your SME partner doesn't fully perceive feedback as a call to action, but it's something that, you know, it's just good to know. As I told you, if you speak to the French people, Russian people, and you're very much sugarcoating, they don't see this as something that they should change. And your SME or partner gets offended because they lose face. I probably wouldn't take a lot of your time by explaining this notion of losing face because this is a big thing in itself, but uh, it is important to understand that for many relationship-based cultures, any public offense, especially if it's done in a public um, in a public manner, and let's say in, in, in the presence of other people, this can be very, very offensive. So um, in this case, I'd like to go through all of these points very briefly and conclude my presentation style uh, performance and to literally get to uh, the conversation with Tom and with you guys. Even though we've had this uh, point when we had a dialogue, I still would, would appreciate more. I'd like to say what we can do to avoid the things that can go wrong and to welcome you to connect me if you want to get a more comprehensive version of the suggestions. So I'd like to make sure that whenever uh, there is no expectation of the feedback uh, on the side of your vis-a-vis, -vis, we always figure out if their expectation can be created. So before the start of the project, it's very, very advisable to introduce a section that will say that, for example, after the first lecture, after the first um, month of work, or after the first iteration to be completed, there will be a feedback session with this and that people, or there will be a written feedback provided, or there will be something like that. So you actually shape the expectation for feedback if this is something important for you, and if you believe that you might come from different cultural code and the feedback expectations will be different. When your partner does not understand that what you provide is feedback, it's highly, uh, mm, it's highly recommended to go onto the written form of conversation 
first of all, instead of the oral form of the conversation. And second, it is very, very advisable to highlight that you have exactly approached this right moment, which you've planned in the beginning of your collaboration, to be feedback. And in this point, you can create the understanding that this point of your conversation is called feedback. If your, uh, if your SME or your partner doesn't see feedback as something necessary at all, it's very, very advisable to consider bringing other external people as feedback providers, for example, higher leadership or anonymous reviews from the students or listeners. So there is something more official that you can relate to. And for the majority of cultures that don't see feedback as necessary, this will usually be a guarantee for a more open dialogue in this regard. For those partners in SMEs who don't fully perceive feedback as a call to action, I would highly, highly recommend to follow up the conversation with a very specific but polite list of bullet points that need to be amended or improved or changed in terms of the next iteration of the, um, of the work. It can also be uh, aligned with certain deadlines or it can also be aligned with certain leaders who are supposed to be responsible for the verification of the changes. So I think this is something that can help you work this situation out. And when it comes to providing feedback, especially for those who are afraid to lose face, I kindly recommend you to avoid strong negative uh, wording in relation to their work or hard or soft skills. And of course, provide the first feedback sessions only one-on-one, -on -one, not in the presence of the other people, because this is something that's usually the most sensitive part of the conversation. So at this point of time, I'd like to say that there are several other important points that we need to remember in order to avoid failures. But I haven't put them down on this list because I would like to stimulate you to get in touch with me and I'll be super happy to provide my list of what else can be done apart from what I've already said today. If you uh, shoot a message to my email or connect me via um, LinkedIn, which is here, uh, available at the uh, QR code with a small dinosaur, or contact me via WhatsApp or Telegram, they're all available. I'll be happy to share this again later with you by the very end of the stream, and I'm sure Tom will also be happy to share this with you. And I'll be gladly sharing a free small PDF with you with my other comments on what can be done in order to improve the quality of a feedback-related conversation between you and your international partner. So at this point of time, I think I've overtaken already the time that I've expected to spend on the presentation-based conversation. And I'll be super happy to answer your questions, comments, cases, etc. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. That was really, uh, really informative. Lots to take away there. Um, and uh, a, a good uh, a good opportunity to grab grab a freebie for a takeaway there. So make sure you reach out after the uh, after the live stream. Um, we did get um, some questions around some of the research. Um, this is way out of my uh, area of expertise, so I'm going to hand these directly over to you. Um, <laughs> so bu -bu -bu, um, you mentioned Ho Hofsted or Hof Hofstad, something, some pronunciation of that name. There mm -hmm. we go. Um, was his cultural dimensions theory discredited? Um, read somewhere that the data was biased and originally designed to measure job satisfaction at IBM. Okay. Um, I think there was an extension of this. Um, multiple critiques of his theory. Um, and honestly, I think there was a lot of sexist and racist language in the work. For instance, he described the Indian culture as feminine. Mm. Um, yeah, as I say, way out of my area of expertise. So I'll hand those straight over to you. <laughs> okay. Um First of all, many thanks for this question. And I really, really didn't expect that we'll have such uh, well-prepared participants. And I do hope that the answer will be also uh, interesting and important for the other listeners. So uh, once again, Tom, can you tell me what's the name of the uh, viewer who is asking this question so that I could address properly? Um, oh, I'm terrible with name pronunciation. Oh. I even know this person. I'm so sorry. Um, no worries. Saidi. Okay. Saidi, that. Yep, that's, that's, that's right. Now that I hear it again, that's right. Um, I, hope, I hope I read it correctly. 
excited. First of all, thank you so very much for your question. And I'll be happy to continue this conversation with you later over LinkedIn or email or WhatsApp, whatever means of communication is more uh, appropriate for you. Why I've indeed mentioned Hofstetter and what I think about the critique of his uh, work. Uh, first of all, I mentioned Hofstetter because it's perhaps one of the most um, uh, well-known and well-heard um, of names in the world of intercultural communication. So it usually um, leaves very little result for the participants when they mention a more rarely, um, let's say, more rarely recognized or rarely known names. So I did hope that if I mention more recognizable names, it can gain some, uh, it can help uh, provoke some thinking of the of the well-known name and I hope that maybe this will be relatable to your already existing experience so this is one thing the other thing is indeed he was criticized many times and the interesting thing is uh, I believe he was criticized by our contemporary uh, colleagues by our by our colleagues who live in the 21st century mostly because the data is becoming outdated so he was collecting his information back in the previous century and he indeed was working a lot with IBM. And from what I know, a lot of his insights are limited in terms of uh, applicability for the current situation. First of all, because this was a certainly limited number of uh, statistical data. First, second of all, because time has changed and cultures are changing dramatically quickly. And that's specifically why I'm referring more to mayor statistics rather than to hostetic statistics. However, the point number three is that even though Hofstede is dead and he passed away some time ago, there is still a team that works on the project called Hofstede Culture Compass. And from what I know, and I'm terribly sorry if I'm wrong, but I believe they are still collecting data these days and they're updating the data from the founding father. So the data that you will see now on Hofstede's Culture Compass team will be a more fresh data, first of all. And second of all, this will be more... Uh, applicable to the current realities and what is more the culture compass gives you a much more detailed description related to specific countries these days so it also is supposed to be more diverse in terms of its representation compared to just IBM managers however considering that other scientists who are making their claims about cultural studies have far less representative data sets compared to Hofstede, I still believe that he deserves attention. He deserves being uh, studied and deserves being read, which is more important. He, I could agree with you regarding the sexist language and the racist language. However, again, let's make sure that we are contextualizing the knowledge. So the knowledge that came from Hofstede was back in the 20th century. And what is more, in his uh, explanation of feminine versus masculine, He's making a very clear distinction that this is not exactly that people of a certain culture behave more feminine or behave more masculine. There is an explanation behind these terms, which are, let's say, just coined terms in order to make the cultural access more perceivable, understandable for the general populace. What he meant under feminine culture is less competitive culture. And what he meant under masculine culture is more competitive culture. Perhaps I would agree with you that it would be a good idea to change the names and to suggest other wording for this specific dimensions. However, we are just being respectful to the founding father and to the work that he has done. If it wasn't for his work, we probably would have never even thought of spreading the cultures across different axes in a scientific manner, rather than just, you know, basing on our biases or you know speculating based on stereotypes so even though this work of him has certain disadvantages these days and i strongly recommend to explore other uh sources for instance i highly appreciate an australian source called culture atlas and i highly appreciate um a source I'll, I'll leave uh, other uh, sources with you if you don't mind later with the proper names of the researchers but anyway, I still believe that um, it's it's a good idea to to get back to his dimensions because uh, some of his work is um, is not being repeated. Well, that's really interesting. That's uh, I think it's, it's it's one of those things where you don't expect that to be where the conversation today goes. But actually, I think it's 
it's good to see that amount of rigor and conversation in a topic. It's kind of, I always think it's concerning when an area, especially something like culture, is like, no, this is just correct and everyone agrees. It's like, then we're probably wrong, aren't we? Like mm-hmm. that. There's no way that this should be that clear cut. So really oh. interesting. Um, we've got oh, another audience request here. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, could you speak about the most difficult cases related to feedback you've had with your own clients? Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah, I can definitely share a case. Um, it will probably showcase uh, my failure back at the time. But I, for the sake of improving your understanding, guys, I'll be happy to share my failure. And um, since uh, I'm not exactly from the culture, or at least in my professional culture, that's not an issue of losing face. I think I, I should be OK with that. Uh, one of the cases which happened to me was back in the early days of my professional um, career when I started cooperating with my partners from the UAE. We know the culture in the UAE has been developing dramatically quickly, especially in the last um, 20 years, with this huge influx of um, expats coming from abroad. And at the moment, statistics is tricky because there is very diverse statistics, actually, from 11 to 15 percent of the population are the locals, the um, Emiratis, and the others are the expats. So uh, it's interesting why I'm mentioning this, because it is always very confusing. And until you actually uh, learn a bit more about the person, you don't know if you're speaking to an Emirati person or to an expat from another Arabic country, maybe Jordan, maybe Lebanon, etc. So. I had a situation when um, a potential partner of mine with whom we've had a conversation, with whom we've had several calls, and we discussed an opportunity to deliver a lecture to our uh, participants of the program, uh, was offering uh, another lecture as an additional lecture for um, the program. And this lecture was his relative. And he was providing a program for us and introduced a lecture of his relative into the program on the topic which wasn't really relevant to us. And it was very, very, very challenging to explain to him that we indeed don't need the presentation of another lecture. And it was irrelevant in terms of topic. And it was, uh, let's say, not quite acceptable for us because we were searching for a diversity of lecturers rather than the lecturers on a practical matter though but still coming from one and the same family background etc so i can say that i quite failed in this uh because i however hard i tried to be very nuanced and careful and delicate i probably didn't provide enough of sugar coating and i've actually expressed the real reason why we don't need that specific lecture instead of providing a more um, let's say, acceptable, culturally acceptable reason for not um, welcoming the second lecturer. I could have come up with an idea that we need more time to uh, understand the needs of the client in terms of the second lecturer, or I could have said something like, um, we have limitation in terms of time, etc., etc. But instead, I've been more direct than expected, and it was a pretty uncomfortable situation for all of us. So from that moment on, I usually try to follow certain rules, which includes, first of all, learning more about your colleague through the other contacts that you have in common. So asking whether this or that would be acceptable and verifying your hypothesis with another person is very, very a nice idea, especially if it's not just yet another person on your funnel of experts, but it is an important expert for you, someone who plays a crucial role in your curriculum, for example. So um, I understand that it sounds very foggy, like, oh, how do I guess which is the best way to go? But in this regard, if you follow the principles which I've described, and if you also follow the principles which I've mentioned and will share with you in a PDF, I do hope that it makes significantly less chance for you to fail 
But without practice in this regard, of course, it's going to be very, very hard for you to navigate this environment. Anyway, I do hope that I've answered this question. And let's see if maybe we have some more. Yeah, really interesting and thank you for sharing uh sharing a real example i know it's um something we talk about a lot actually on this on this channel more broadly is how so often what gets talked about in you know webinars conferences social media is only ever the good things you only ever see the look at this massive success yeah. um but i know certainly a lot of my biggest learning points in my career have been the moments where i've walked away going oh wow that went badly yeah. Um, that's uh, that's been really useful. So, um, if you've got any questions in the chat, please do put them in there. Um, this is a, a good opportunity to ask someone who really knows what they're talking about. After this, it's just back to me and occasionally Joey on the channel. So that's done after this session. I uh, wouldn't ask us any questions. Um, something um, something I've actually been thinking about a lot recently um, is about how I think there's. Certainly, I, I've been guilty of it, of, of this illusion of everyone's getting closer. All cultures mm -hmm. are becoming mm -hmm. more and more similar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, be it because technology allows us to talk to people further away than ever before, or, you know, politically, countries that used to seem very distant are now much closer. Mm -hmm. And we talk and hear a lot more about them. Um, I mean, is that actually true because i kind of feel like oh of course it is but then i have a conversation with someone and i kind of almost realize that maybe in some ways it is but maybe in some ways it isn't um so i'd be really interested to hear your thoughts around that about whether or not our cultures are actually becoming more similar or whether mm -hmm. or not it's just a perception thing hmm. Interesting question, Tom, and I'm not sure we we have enough time to answer it properly, but I'll be very superficial and I'll share my perspective on that. And thank you very much for this question. It's actually a brilliant question. I share my idea in regards to the fact that our cultures are becoming much more connected, with the exception of certain cultures and countries which are, let's say, either isolating themselves from the rest of the world or uh, prefer to go their own paths and uh, don't appreciate much of international contact. And we all know these examples. But in the majority of cases, out of 193 officially recognized countries in the world, we probably have the vast majority um, getting closer to each other in terms of connectivity, transportation connectivity, uh, technological protocols, um, common language, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, brand unanimity. Um, so um, economic ties in general provoke this certain connectivity. However, when it comes to similarity, I'll always be the first one to say that it is far from, from being true. Um, simply because if you take something very, very obvious and illustrative, such as language, you will see that you have a certain number of countries where English is considered to be official language. But take, for instance, Singapore and the USA. Take the UK and South Africa. You will notably see that First of all, in Singapore and South Africa, you'll have massive influence of other languages, which are official in the country. And you'll have a, a pretty big group of people who prefer to speak another language than English, and they will not see their, their native language as English. You will also, by the way, Africa has officially 11, uh, has, South Africa officially has 11 languages. Uh, so if you didn't know about that, uh, just a um, quick, uh, Quick, quick recommendation to have a look at this marvelous country and explore a bit more. So you see, for instance, even UK and the US English uh, being very different. And uh, you will see how culturally far away the two countries are. And you also see that in Singapore, very often people joke about themselves that they say, I'm quoting, we speak Singlish rather than English, which is Singaporean English. So it's, it's very distinctively different let alone the fact that you take some countries which are very close to each other and which are historically sharing a lot in common. For instance, again, pardon me, but I, I'll come back with the Saudi example because I've just um, come back from, from this business trip and it felt very emotional. You can see that the two countries are quite close to each other historically, ethnically, etc., etc. They share the same religion, similar traditions, 
Um, they talk about themselves as the GCC countries, so they rarely say that we are Arabic countries. They say they are GCC countries, like the countries which are very closely united by economic union, the same territory, etc. Uh, how far the cultures will be in many, many different instances, even in the means of communication. For example, in um, the Emirates, the majority of population will be using WhatsApp and um, exchanging messages on WhatsApp, while in Saudi, the most popular means of communication will be Snapchat. It's just one small example. And I'm, I'm happy to enumerate many more, but it is just a matter of several hours of drive of distance. And historically, again, people would be very connected. And for a foreign eye, traditional Arabic clothes would even look the same. However, it's not. Um, so we might see that we're getting so much closer, but then you end up somewhere quite close to where you live and you see a tip, a, an absolutely different pattern of behavior, consumption, um, inter-family communication, intra-family communication and work and whatnot. And it definitely explains to you that we as humans have a very strong capacity of connect with the ones who are close to us. And the fact that we are sharing a certain geographical proximity makes it easier for us to um, share certain things, whilst uh, the fact that we are connected with each other through Zoom or an airplane, of course, makes it easier for us to understand each other. But that hasn't made our culture synonymous. Mm. No, really interesting. I think that's uh, that's really good to know. We, oh, we have got a, a question from the audience. Uh, this may be the last one we have time for. We shall oh. see. Um, so uh, thank you for the answer. It's very nice and personal. Um, could you give some practical advice, for example, how to handle feedback when you don't know much about the audience? Oh, that is tricky. So, yeah, that would be what, what a great question to finish up on. Uh, there we go. Nice and easy. What if you know nothing about your audience and you want to give them some feedback? So uh, over to you. Okay. The question is um, whether you are the one who wants to receive feedback or whether you are the one who wants to give feedback. And this is always the critical difference. If, for example, let's imagine we haven't spoken much about receiving feedback. Let's say we are in the situation where we want to receive feedback and we don't know much how the the, audi the audience is segmented, like where people come from and what's typical for them in this specific situation, I suggest several small life hacks. The first one is anonymity. So once we provide anonymity to our audience, there's always much, much easier to collect feedback to ensure that nobody is um, offending you by their critical remarks, even though to Tom they might not sound offending at all, um, a, I don't know, a, a, a Mongolian person in the audience might think that they're actually being too critical. So uh, the fact that you're providing anonymity by tools such as Menti, for example, which I tried to use but failed in the beginning, or some other tools like Google Forms or any other tool which allows full anonymity, and this should be highlighted, gives you a higher chance to collect a more advanced feedback. The other idea is that um, there is a very uh, big difference compared to, it, there is a very big difference in what language you collect your feedback in. So when it comes to speaking your native language, sometimes we are less prone to be emotional and critical compared to when we speak the other, when we speak foreign language simply because in our own native language, it is prohibited to be very critical to somebody and we don't feel that it's natural. While, for example, in a foreign language, personally for me, it will be easier to be more critical to another person. For the other cultures, it's vice versa. So uh, it is quite important to identify the opportunity to give feedback in the native language. If that's possible, if that's doable, for example, if you have a mixed audience, uh, I don't know, um, American Korean audience, um, give them a chance to provide feedback in the written form, for example, uh, in their own native language, English or Korean. This will give you a chance to receive a more extended feedback, especially for those who don't feel very comfortable using their second language. 
So this is what I've noticed. It actually it actually changes a lot the way you perceive feedback. The native language feedback is quite often more, um, but yeah, let's say it's it's more deep. Point I'll be happy to share here would be about uh, different ways of verifying your feedback. So for example, one way is when you provide an anonymous poll during um, the end, the final part of the conversation or a lecture or something. And at this point of time, you ask people to provide their immediate feedback. This is when they're still fresh in their emotions, when they're still impressed or vice versa, not impressed at all. And this is the situative feedback, let's call it this way. And if you want to make sure that you've received more um, balanced feedback, it's a good idea to later come back uh, with another form or with another type of request uh, in a different shape. For example, um, share your testimonials or maybe it would be a good idea if you could recommend us some, some certain things to improve. So collecting feedback in several stages also provides an opportunity to receive a more adequate and a more proper feedback. So this is something I've noticed. There are several more points which I'd like to share, but probably we'll, um, we'll need to, to wrap it up soon. And I still want to hear some words of feedback from our audience, actually. Brilliant. No, I think that's really interesting. I think this, um, it, it, you know, it's funny. We use the idea of um, put, record your thoughts here. It's completely anonymous. We use that quite often in the kind of learning design world. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's happy sheets at the end of training, uh, mm -hmm. if you use those or performance surveys or pulse surveys inside your organization. Um, so that's not really a, a, a current kind of foreign idea for us. But I think we so often get hung up on the idea that feedback is this super personal relationship based thing mm. um, that the idea of making it anonymous almost doesn't work. But I suppose like 360 feedback has been a oh, 360. You have to be brave to actually do 360 feedback. I grant you. Um, but if you're feeling it, do it. It's amazing. It'll improve mm -hmm. your career. Um, mm -hmm. But even if not, I think that's a really interesting idea. It's something I've never even thought about, though, just generally making feedback anonymous and how it would actually allow people to be more honest if, you know, mm -hmm. if there's that voice it holding them back. It's a fantastic idea. Um, so that's all the questions. Um, that we've got in the chat. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess is you know, f final bit of time is over over to you if you want to get feedback from people sure, or anything yeah. you want to do. Yeah, I think one of the tips that um, usually helps uh, with feedback in terms of operating different cultural patterns in the group is shaping the expectations clearly, as I've already said before. So, for example, now I would be very, very happy if you could provide one line in the chat being the thing that you found to be the most um, helpful and practically applicable to your work, that be with SMEs or with the other partners, after the conversation that we've had. Again, I'm so sorry that we didn't have a chance to see your faces and to hear your voices, but that's, that's the... Um, the natural disadvantage of this format. I was still very, very happy to see your comments. So please share with me your ideas, one line per person if that's possible. Um, don't go too long. Um, just one idea which you felt to be the most important and practical in terms of your future work to when it comes to uh, feedback in the intercultural environment. Let's maybe wait couple of, um, yeah, maybe just let's wait one minute and see uh, if we can receive something. But Tom, what was the feedback failure that you've experienced this morning? Yes. Oh, this was, this was interesting. Um, so I, I was working uh, with some colleagues and we had a situation where the, the work had been reviewed a couple of times. Uh, it was in, we kind of felt it needs tweaks, but it's in a good state. Um, and there was about a 25 minute conversation about something really specific in it. Mm. Now, if you, in my world, if you spend 25 minutes talking about something, something needs to be changed because mm -hmm. you're not sure, not sure but that 25 minutes was everyone agreeing that it was fine exactly how it was. Mm -hmm. But I completely misunderstood that. 
So I went into, right, what do we need to change? And exactly what do you want it to be? And how does that impact the flow? And I really confused everyone because no one else wanted anything to change. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, to me, it's like, sorry, you spent half an hour to say, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. It does. In my mind, it made no sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 10 minutes after I was there going, well, of course, it's obvious. Um, I should have, if I'd have just, if I'd have stopped assuming, oh, there's clearly something to change here and just listened, I would have realized, oh yeah, they're just saying how this is exactly what they want, but they're explaining why it's exactly what they want. Cause they wanted collectively to talk themselves through it. Um, it was a whole new experience for me. Interesting. Um, it was, the, it was my first experience actually working with these uh, with these people at a review stage. Okay. Um, so it was one of those kind of right, remember this, because clearly it's going to be their way of working through okay. it. Um, very, very collaborative, very much. Uh, let's talk if, if, if there's a one, it was a one and a half minute video, um, but it's going to be talked through kind of bit by bit. Um, nice. So that'll be an experience when we go back to do the next round of review. Um, cool. But sure. yeah, it. It's, uh, oh, here we go. We have got something from the audience, though. Um, Let me, uh, sorry, Tom, before we go, go to the audience, if you don't mind, may I just leave a short comment here? Please. I, I do believe that it's very much just like people who are process-oriented or result-oriented. So mm. some people would generally enjoy the process and the alignment, and they would appreciate sharing thoughts during the uh, this alignment stage. If it's the first review, maybe it's exactly their reason why they go through things in, in a detail to make sure that there is a um, synchronization or alignment of certain work for the future. But uh, the second comment I wanted to leave is, I think if, if it's done um, smoothly and nicely, there is a fantastic chance for you to provide your feedback in case your colleagues are happy to hear it about mm. the fact that you sometimes get a little confused if some things are to be seen as calls to action and the others are not. So there can easily be a chance to um, ask them about this and just uh, um, clarify the, the expectations in the very beginning of each point of discussion. Why not? Uh, we, we, in fairness, collectively, we did all actually have a good laugh about it afterwards. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> once, once I kind of got it, everyone. The one th uh, uh, that's one thing I have learned is actually I think there's sometimes a fear around, oh, if I misstep we're going to go from zero to everyone's yeah. angry in a second yeah. yeah and actually i found that to be very rarely the case mm -hmm. but even if someone's immediate response is oh i found that to be abrupt or offensive sure it's not actually very often someone will go from oh to right that's it the world's ending usually yeah. it's slightly more kind of let me let me explain this yeah. um you know i can only think of maybe one or two times where things have actually gone because of a single misstep nice. i guess then if you go back and do it again is kind of where the danger is mm -hmm. um but um but yeah we did get a comment through i want to make sure i've got the audience comments up because they are more important than i um so here we go i thought the idea about the language you share feedback in was the most applicable uh once again thank you for the stream it was incredibly informative well there we go that's lovely feedback <laughs> thank you very much thank you so much for the for the feedback and if you have any other feedback then um, super happy to again uh, welcome you to any way of um, connecting with me. So I'll just gladly share in the last for the last moments the screen with my contacts. So um, yeah, LinkedIn is the QR code, and any other means of communication are fine. Um, with the rest of the things, I believe we are good. I just now start thinking of some other points which I thought could be helpful to share but now it's too late anyway could be the chance for us to meet again tom and uh, discuss other points absolutely and uh, just so you know as well links to everything um uh, christina's linkedin and website everything will be in the description for this episode in about half an hour or so once it's up live mm -hmm. um the recording will always be available so please do share it with your friends colleagues on social media anyone you think will benefit from this um, as I said at the start, I think this is a a really vital core skill that is just continuously overlooked mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about, you know, a career in learning and development. 
Um, and I think it's uh, certainly, I know if I'd have had it at the start of my career, I would have been more successful in those early years, uh, being able to work, just work better with more people, um, mm -hmm. which is always, always good. But um, we are up on the on the time limits. So I want to say thank you so much, Christina, for giving us two hours of your time. Thank you. Um, no, it's been a it's been a real pleasure. I know I've got loads to take away from this, and I'm sure everyone in the audience feels the same way. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us live as well. Um, thank you to everyone who's watching but isn't live. I think that there are 49 people who have started after we started, but are currently working their way through. When you get here, well done, you made it all the way through. Hello. Yes, and please uh, leave the, the comments uh, uh, about what was valuable for you. It will be very much appreciated for Tom and myself. Absolutely, it would. Um, but other than that, until, well, we've got another live stream at the end of the month, I usually have the update, but until then, Thank you so much, all of you, for your time. Have an amazing rest of the week. And do remember to come back and let us know what you put into action off the back of this session. Thank you so much, Tom. I wish you a lovely evening and to our listeners and viewers as well. I hope you all will have a very intercultural time ahead.